During the Masters of the Air air-to-air -air attack clips, it appears the bomber gunners are firing on enemy aircraft with other friendly formation bombers in the background. The intent of this video is to address the question, how often did bomber gunners fire on other bombers during combat missions? Bombers flew in a tight, well-disciplined formation. Bomber formations were modified throughout the war to address changing German tactics and threats. The three key factors that must be considered in formation development are discussed on this page from a declassified 1945 Tactical Doctrine B-29 Combat Command document titled Gunnery and the B-29 The Tactical Use of Equipment. The main objective of the formation is to deliver a concentration of bombs on target. Formations must allow for flyability. The spacing and stacking of the bombers are arranged to minimize pilot fatigue. The formation's lead plane picks the formation speed, altitude, course, and in addition, it is the only plane that can fly on autopilot. The bombers need to drop their bombs in formation to maximize bombs on target. Lastly, the bombers need to increase gun coverage. No formation can be defined that maximizes all three of these attributes. Compromises need to be made. A super tight large formation will be best for bombing, but would be easy to attack and difficult to fly. The best formation to defend against enemy aircraft would be bombers stacked one on top of another but this will not be feasible during bomb release and it would be difficult to fly. Crews must work as a team to defend the formation by engaging enemy aircraft and not fire on other bombers within your formation. At the end of 1943, the 8th Army Air Forces started blind bombing, and in anticipation of long-range fighter escort, the 54 Aircraft Combat Wing was replaced by the more manageable 36 Aircraft Combat Box. The quantity of bomb bomber ammo carried varied with model, as shown on this page from a 1945 Army Air Forces Technical Service Command document titled Tactical Planning Characteristics and Performance. The columns are the B-17 model and block number, number of guns, rounds per gun, and location and type of gun station. 5,340 rounds were carried on the final G model. The bomber's machine gun's rate of fire and maximum range is discussed on this page from a 1944 Aviation Training Division document titled Air Crewman gunnery manual. The Browning 50 caliber M2 machine gun fires from 750 to 850 rounds per minute or up to 14 rounds per second. The lethal range equates to 4 miles. The effective range of the bomber guns is discussed on this page from a 1945 U.S. Air Force Historical Studies document titled Flexible Gunnery Training in the AAF. 600 yards was the maximum effective distance for bomber flexible and iron-sided machine guns. All of the bombers within the formation are within both the effective range and lethal range. Since the lethal range was out to 4 miles, this is one reason why bombers' formations were spaced to this distance, so stray rounds from one formation will not hit the adjacent formations. Aircraft sighting and recognition was stressed on the gunner's training syllabus, as shown on this table outlining the gunner's course curriculum. Sighting and recognition courses are in this row. So how often did bomber gunners fire on other bombers or themselves in combat? The B-17s, B-24s, and B-29 turrets were all equipped with fire interrupters to keep from shooting your own airplane. This is an example of a B-17 ball turret follower interrupter and the zones of propeller protection. The interrupter did not protect the landing gear or bomb bay doors when in the deployed or open position respectively. The waist guns were mounted such that the gunner's field of fire did not allow shooting your own wing as shown in this clip of a B-17F model. In 1944, the U.S. Army Air Forces released a report with regard to the source of damage that bombers sustained as described on this page from a headquarters 20th Air Force document titled, Combat Losses and Damage of the 8th Air Forces. Data collected included location, direction, source, and severity of damage. The holes on every returning 8th Air Force bomber was cataloged. The database included the damage of 25,000 bombers. This table lists the results of the study from a 1947 U.S. Air Force Historical Studies document titled The Combined Bomber Offensive, January 1st through June 6, 1944. The data is valid for both B-17s and B-24s. The columns list the source of damage and incidence of damage by month. Additional damage source roll-up and percent of total columns were added to aid in discussion. Ground artillery flak accounted for the largest source of bomber damage at 83.7% of the 15,008 bomber damage findings. 
air-to-air -air rockets, aerial bombs, and 30 millimeter cannon fire contributed to a low 0.1%. Enemy aircraft 20 millimeter cannon fire accounted for 4.5%. Enemy aircraft machine gun fire accounted for 2.4%. German aircraft machine guns were either the 7.93 or 13.7 millimeter caliber size. 50 caliber friendly fire machine gun damage accounted for 0.2% of bomber damage and self-inflicted machine gun fire accounted for 1.4% of damage. Balling empty shell cases and links accounted for 3.8% of the damage and the remaining 1.5% of damage included other sources and unknown causes. Based on the results of this study, both self-inflicted and friendly fire machine gun bullets accounted for 1.6% of the damage sustained on returning bombers. This is a small value as compared to the damage contribution from the other sources. The report goes on to state that when enemy opposition is heavy, up to 20% of all machine gun hits are from either self-inflicted or friendly fire. Waste gunners shooting their own horizontal stabilizers is a significant source of self-inflicted damage. The likelihood of friendly fire from escorts is remote. Although they flew within the lethal range of the formations they escorted, the fighters would usually engage the enemy aircraft prior to bomber interception. The escort fighters were also concerned that they would come under attack by the formation gunners by misrecognition, as discussed on this page from a 1945 66th 8th Air Force Fighter Wing document titled A History of the 8th Air Force Fighter Command. Escort fighters worried about being fired upon by bomber gunners. Bomber gunners could not take a chance. The rule of thumb is that if any fighter points his nose towards you, you fire at him when within range. During D-Day, there was a big concern of Navy ships firing on U.S. fighters protecting the ships over the channel. This is one reason why P-38s were assigned this task, as discussed on this 1944 8th Air Force Tactical Operations in Support of the Allied Landings Document. The P-38's twin boom overhead profile is easily recognizable and will not be confused with any German aircraft. This chart lists the causes of 8th Army Air Force's bomber aircrew casualties for returning crewmen based on a 1962 U.S. Army Surgeon General report titled Wound Ballistics. Flak accounted for 86.2% of casualties, 20mm cannon shells 3.9%, machine guns 0.6%, secondary missiles 7.8%, and unknown at 1.5%. Secondary missiles include plexiglass fragments, airframe fragments, bullet-resistant glass, electrical components, and 50 caliber ammunition. The damage distributions between the bomber and crew member trend well. 21st Bomber Command was also concerned with friendly fire during the shift from high-altitude daylight missions to nighttime low-altitude firebombing missions, as discussed on this 1945 21st Bomber Command document titled Analysis of Incendiary Phases of Operation, March 9th through 19th, 1945. The greatest danger during nighttime missions was friendly fire. B-29s were instructed to remove all ammo during the March 9th Tokyo firebomb mission. Tail guns were to be loaded with ammo on the follow-on Nagoya mission with instructions to fire on enemy aircraft only if fired upon. The lower turrets were loaded on the next Osaka mission with instructions to fire only on ground targets like searchlights or targets at lower altitudes. In summary, friendly machine gun fire accounted for a small percentage of either airframe damage or crew member casualties. No specific data is provided for friendly fire crew casualties, but I suspect it would trend with the airframe friendly fire value at around 0.2% of casualties. I can't think of a situation where self-inflicted machine gun fire would cause a crew injury. The data is based on returning bombers, so some survivor bias is built into the values. Friendly fire is likely due to other bombers, not fighter escorts. If flying escort, though, don't point your fighter at a bomber formation. If you found this study interesting and informative, please consider engaging by commenting, liking, and or subscribing to the channel, World War II U.S. Bombers.